Well, hello, hello, everybody. Uh, let me make sure I'm good to go with sound. I thought I would start up a uh, composer symposium, and the topic that I want to talk about today is actually G flat major because I'm learning it. I feel like I, I'm in a, I, I'm in a period of really exploring my weaknesses and and trying to figure out where's the the holes in my knowledge about composition. And um, I, I have a tendency to, when I practice, to go for what's comfortable and not necessarily what I need to be working on. And so I decided that I was going to just really hammer in G flat major. And um, so give me one second here. I'm trying to find my live streaming link. See if it, if uh, it's tracking that I'm live right now. Okay, yeah, looks like I uh, I'm on there. So, um, so if you're you're around right now on YouTube or you're you know you get a notification, you may want to go ahead and just jump on and let me know if you've got questions. What I what I plan on doing is just talking about what I'm actually personally doing right now to study it. I, I think that may be kind of interesting. So what I started doing, um, and uh, I don't always make these kind of worksheets, but I figured because I was going to try to do this today that it would be a good thing for me to write it up. So um, what I've done is I've taken... G major, and I've gone to the resources that that I know um, that will help you get your head around a key, right? And I I start off looking up what was a good fingering for the scale, and there was a book I read a while ago, um, and it was called I didn't finish the whole thing by the way, but it was called Natural Fingering, and it's this book that lays out a pretty convincing case about what kind of uh, fingering you should be using at the piano to to make it less you know stressful on your hands and basically what what this fingering is it's kind of cool is um, that you you are always kind of pivoting on the same you know uh, fingers so you're always pivoting like on your thumb and it makes it simple to kind of get your head wrapped around how you should be doing it. And then on top of that, uh, so I wrote out that fingering just to practice it. And I spent time practicing. Right? Now, the other thing that uh, is really cool about, about this is that it points out where you've got these, like, little groups. And what I've done is an exercise here. And I think this is actually a valuable exercise and um, if you're a composer, getting comfortable with your keys, I think, is, is really valuable. And you could try this out. You grip your hand into the hand grip. So, right, four, three, two, one. Or sorry, uh, you know, one, two, three, four in the right hand. And one, two, three, four in the left hand, starting on B. Um, actually, where did I write this one? I, I wrote it out right here. You can see these are the two grips. And what you do is you practice just jumping the grips up the scale. Um, and what that allows you to do is to quickly shift. So when you actually put it together in the scale, I'm not really having to think what's the next note, what's the next note. I can, as long as I can get my hand to that next position, and it's, it's kind of mirror image on either hand. Right, so it's a really cool way to to figure out how to, to um, how to memorize a scale quickly, and I think uh, if you spend a little bit of time doing that, which is the the second exercise on my sheet here, you'll you'll see quickly the the value of it. It's like how you're grouping your fingers as you go up the scale. It just it makes you a little bit more accurate, a little faster. Right. I'm still working on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So, um, and then I've got some basic chordal movements here too. I think everybody needs to practice, and I'm probably going to add to this. In an, and in different positions in the right hand. I like to think of your right hand as moving positions and not necessarily inversions, because to me, an inversion is this, right? Where you change the bass note. But a position, right? It still sounds the same, it just sounds like you're kind of arpeggiating up and down. Right, so you keep going up in position. Once again, why I'm working on G-flat, because I don't have it all under my fingers. Um, now, there's a lot more that you could be doing, you know. One, four, one is another one, and I'm going to probably write these out on the sheet as well. Um, what those end up teaching you, though, is they kind of ingrain proper voice leading, you know. That's resolving correctly. The seventh is resolving. Just all good stuff. Um, so I see uh, Miss Amityville there. Hello. Welcome. Um, yeah, so the other stuff on here is I thought I would kind of make it fun for myself. Now, you don't have to if you end up like downloading this sheet, which I'll try to put a link under the video. But um, if you you don't have to play through these, what they are is little tiny, like tiny compositions. And um, my goal was to use the stuff that I've got to practice as um, as kind of motivation for composing. Let's see. There we go. Right, it's a nice way to kind of play on the scale and, um, you know, practice improvising around using things that I think sound kind of cool, but still a little bit more modern. Um, so let's... So I just figured, you know what, I'm going to write a couple things using the scale, little short exercises. And like I said, I think probably you'll get more benefit actually sitting down and writing stuff in G flat major, because when was the last time you did write something in G flat major? Um, and uh, you'll get to know the key a lot better. So just doing this, this kind of exercise um, I think is really valuable. And there's also one, one of the things I'm really uh, spending a ton of time doing right now is practicing my, my voicings for my jazz piano lessons, right? And I'm going through everything in all 12 keys and I'm trying to drill it, uh, you know, very thoroughly. And um, I can't say enough how beneficial and how rejuvenating piano is for a composer. Um, over the last week in particular, since I took my first lesson, um, I've been spending a lot more time practicing at the piano, sight reading just from random books, you know, sheet music books that I pick up, uh, which by the way, check your local library, check Goodwill and stuff for those kind of books. And, um, you know, you'll, you're going to find uh, it's really valuable to have, you don't need a huge library, but just having a couple of these little, you know, easy piano books. Well, at my library, I found a John Williams piano anthology for $2. I was like, yes, score. So I've been, I've just been sight reading that stuff uh, for the last few days. But um, to get back on track, just practicing and playing a lot of piano, um, you start to get a lot more connected to the music and, um there's just nothing like sitting down and being able to play what you're hearing in your head and to have the facility and to to get things to the point where it's almost, you know, automatic. Like some of these voicings, 
I've got down quite well now. You know, to where I can move around and and not have to spend a, a ton of time thinking about where I'm going. So, but I expect even more in the next week as I put in more hours, it's gonna it's gonna get tighter and and better. Um, you know, I looked at all of my favorite composers. They're all very competent pianists. Um, most of them are really good at improvising. I mean, there's famous stories about Beethoven being challenged and just putting people to shame. And, you know, Mozart was well known for being an improviser and, and kind of playing around in concerts. In, um, in uh, Box Day, if you were going to be a Kapellmeister or, you know, like the head of the church music program, um, you would be expected to be able to improvise a fugue, you know? So, and I'm sure they would like to throw curveballs at you and be like, do it in C double flat, you know? <laughs> so something crazy. So, um, so yeah, this, this kind of ability to, and, and I have to say it's, it's really stayed around in jazz as a genre is improvising, knowing things from, you know, by ear, learning by ear, transcribing. These are all very valuable uh, activities. And jazz, that's how jazz has always been transmitted properly is through, you know, oral oral uh, lessons and transcribing and hearing somebody on the spot and trying to copy them and trying to change it and, and playing things by ear. So, so yeah, okay. I guess I'll open up things to questions right now because um, I just wanted to share that uh, you know, what I'm actually personally working on and a key like G flat major, which is something that I think we all tend to ignore. Poor G flat major. We need to give G flat major a chance. It's a beautiful key. Right. That's only like an hour of practice on G flat major. I already feel like I got it. Oh, actually, let me add one more thing. Let me grab a book. I do think it is helpful to um, to just go through and start to list out what you know about the about what you're trying to learn. Um, so I got here G flat six flats. Just memorize that G flat major has six flats. Just if it's a little factoid like that, um, I find it's easier to just be to the point. Be like, bam, it's six flats. Then you can figure out by counting one, two, three, four, because they're always in the same order. They always go in basically the circle of fourths, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat, C flat, right? So six flats. Uh, we already talked about the fingering. Um, you know, look for patterns and things that, that you like that feel natural within the key, um, right? Mess around with things. And when you, when you hear something like, oh, that really, that feels good, <laughs> right? Write that down. It's like, oh, it sounds super resonant down in the low octave or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, just practice progressions and voicings and stuff. So, okay, I will move on from G flat um, and look at some questions here. So, Miss Amityville just joined the Sonata Form course today and is very excited. Yes, that is very exciting. Um, let's see, I've read on your website about the way Bach learned composing. And I was wondering two things. First, do you think transcribing a classical piece, at least the bass and the melody we hear, can help learn composing and improvising? Um, absolutely. That's basically what I was just talking about. So transcribing anything by ear is is beneficial. Um, I just think it's, it's a really... Uh, it's difficult. And the way I would approach it is... Just tell yourself, I'm going to transcribe the first measure, right? It's kind of like anything that is these these really difficult habits that we want to build, we need to start by telling ourselves that we don't need to do a lot of it. We just need to start it, right? Um, I don't need to go on a four-hour run. I need to run around the block, right? So I would say start with a piece that you like. Start with a bar that you like. You don't have to transcribe the first measure. Um, if the first measure is the one that really is like amazing to you, like let's say you're 
you're doing a uh, Tristan and Isolde, right? Right. If you're if you're going to transcribe the the first measure because it's the most amazing one, then do that. Otherwise, I found that often I I'm more moved to transcribe something in the middle that I'm like, how does that work? What is actually going on there? Um, because then you're going to be mo more motivated to finish it. Um, and then what's really cool about transcribing, uh, especially if you, I would recommend doing it at the piano. I I would just you know whatever get your iPhone if you if you don't have your computer at your piano. Um, and listen and then play whatever it is. And then, you know, once you figure it out, play it a little bit, like get it under your fingers to where you don't, you don't have to think too much about playing it. Um, just as you would if you were trying to learn a difficult piano piece. Um, and I, I should say here too, um, that you do even with like rudimentary ru rudimentary piano skills you can still learn segments of music that are difficult right um like i can't i can't play the flight of the bumblebee but i can play like a measure of it right i'm not very good at it. i mean i learned that when i was like a teenager and it's stuck but And sorry, my keyboard action has thrown me off too. But so you've got the capability. I'm not a great pianist by any measure, um, although hoping to be much better now with the lessons. But um, you can learn a little difficult segment of music like that um, and play it as if you're a professional pianist and probably give it a lot of effort because it's only one measure once again. Um, and keeping it small like that you uh, you can actually pick up really, really valuable stuff. Uh, just the other day, I was transcribing Nora Jones's um, version of the uh, the nearness of you, you know da, 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 da. And I like it because you'd think she's going there, right? She doesn't hit that G. She just goes. And this is something that you can pick up as a composer um, if you've got a well-worn progression, right? Like this is basically the progression. Right? So you go from one to it's a two, five, one in four, right? In F, the new key. Well, she takes out that bass note right there and kind of gives it a fresh sound. That's something I didn't transcribe any more than than that measure, basically. I was just like, I'm going to just leave it at that. That sounds really cool. <laughs> right? And then when she comes in with that bass note, that low C, it feels very resonant. Um, so, but, but then what, what do you do with that? Well, you could do the same thing but uh, you know, t take it somewhere else so you can be like, Doo -doo -doo -da -da and then go to a totally different key area. Da -da -da -da. Right? I, I transpose that down a step, and it had to, took me a second to figure out where am I going. I wish I could get that low B flat here, huh? I just an aside, I'm going to build myself a new desk here so I can fit my digital piano underneath. So I've got my full thing. And then I'm going to put this piano, which only has 49 keys up here. So uh, like the more stuff you get as a composer, it's like you, you got to figure out where to put it. That's the problem. <laughs> so my rooms keep getting bigger. I keep stealing bigger rooms in the house. Okay. So hopefully that... Um, that was useful about transcribing. And then as far as the process goes, I mean, it's it's literally hunting and, and pecking. And um, let me see if I can pull up uh, something. Oh, here we go. I was just listening to, I'm on a jazz kick right now, so we'll, we'll, we'll use some jazz, but uh, Springsville, which is a cool piece by Miles Davis and Gil Evans. 
Hold on, that may be a bit loud. I don't know. Right. Uh, highly recommend uh, if you're a composer and uh, you want to hear some really interesting arrangements, Gil Evans' arrangements for Miles Davis are really amazing. But um, all, all you got to do is start to... Oh, let's pick that first bar where he actually comes in. Or the band comes in, I mean. Ba, ba, right? I was close. I, I had an E. Or sorry, I played an F. But that's that note. Ba, and you're just listening for... Is that note right? Right? So let's... Let, Yeah, that's totally the right note. I just, bah, bah. and then I've got a starting point and, you know, I, I should probably write it down. B, bah. Bah, 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 right? The more you are able to sing this kind of stuff, um, and I do recommend singing along. Da, 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 ba, ba, da. Um, the more you are able to hear it and then just try to find that note ba, 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 da, and try to copy articulations. And, you know, if you're doing this from a, a classical piece, copy the articulation as well, because w one of the things is it's hard to transmit articulations and dynamics and shape of phrases it's really difficult to transmit that through paper without hearing it. Um, and so transcribing, regardless of the style, if you try to imitate the style, then um, you're, you're going to be better off. You know, if, uh, and, and actually, you can, you can take it a different direction. And if it's something like you want to have the score and you want to read along with a performer, you probably get some benefit trying to play maybe the melody the way the performer works and if I think of like Mozart uh, what is it the C major is it K15 no K16 I think you take a you know a this right let's just uh, that's like the wrong key but maybe That's the middle movement. It's not helpful. Okay, I'm wasting too much time here on this. Um, let me move on to another question. There's so many things that you get and gain from and can do with transcribing. I would highly recommend do it. If you're afraid of it, just do one measure. Don't even start with writing it down. Just try to hunt and pick up the piano till you get a two bar melody, right? And then you've transcribed and then and then the next time you can do a little bit more and the next time you do a little bit more. Before you know it, you're, you're transcribing entire pieces, so. Let me uh, move on. Let's see. Hi, John. Thanks for the info. Just need time to practice. Don't get much for that, unfortunately. Curse of doing music as a hobby. Yes, but there's always four in the morning. Um, I like to get up early. What can I say? Get up early. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ashton. Hey, Ashton. Uh, G flat major is the death of sanity. I can never write in this key. So that's perfect. You should practice your G flat major then, because we as composers should not fear any key. Um, I do, I, I read a, uh, it was a couple things about Bach, um, but there was some that had some anecdotes from his kids. Um, and one of his sons said he, Bach mastered every single key in every single way. Like he feared not any, any double flats or triple sharps or whatever. Um, so I would, I would say, yeah, that's that's a sign. If it's the death of your sanity, it's the first place that you need to be working on. Uh, let's see. Leonardo saying, hi, what would be your opinion on strict counterpoint in composing? Is it important to master before trying to compose? No, it's not, um, it's not important to master before trying to compose. Uh, one thing is it, it is composing. So if you're trying to master it, you're composing along the way. It's just a, 
it's a set of techniques that are very powerful and um, they are highly recommended for any composer um, you know to master counterpoint but uh, it's not a deal breaker in, in any sort of way and I think if you're worried about should you or should you not I'm gonna say don't don't worry about it because you can get so far without having to worry too much about counterpoint um, just by just by composing simple homophonic music and paying attention to things like resolutions right if you're writing you know and you know that this wants to go right and you're paying attention to that then later on down the road when you get more comfortable composing you're going to write a, a melody that goes like this right and that's that's great counterpoint right there right that's good enough that's what that's all that you need is to understand how these notes go against each other because this is the thing is that we've had a century of just the craziest music right i mean from people composing relatively simple tonal stuff to extremely simple tonal stuff in terms of like super repetitive like let's just play the note c for 45 minutes right all the way to the most complex mathematically generated overtone music and what it means is that our modern ears have opened up to a lot more sounds and so a lot of the things that um were considered i would say faux pas in traditional counterpoint are no longer that big a deal right um and a big one is is like what interval is played against what other interval? Um, and I say this because you can cheat, really, as a modern composer in counterpoint. As long as things are going to where they need to go, then it doesn't really... And they get there at the same time or when you want them to to get there, right? You're, you're thinking about it in terms of, like, things match up in a logical way. Then you don't have to concern yourself too much with all these detailed rules. It's great to learn. Don't get me wrong. I love counterpoint. Every time I've studied counterpoint, I felt like it was really valuable for me as a composer. But I've also been able to write a ton of counter melodies before I studied any counterpoint. Um, so, right, I'm going to start here. A in the left hand, G in the right hand, and I'm going to play just kind of random. Right? It sounds like counterpoint. Now it's weird counterpoint, right? But there, what's the key here is that I'm ending up on this E and a C, right? That's a sixth, or it could be here. It's kind of high up there. Right? If you end up where you need to go. now. The other last secret with counterpoint, and I've got another video of this, I call it the cheater's guide to counterpoint, is you change the rhythm up, right? When one thing is going, the other one's staying still, and when the other one's staying, or the other one's going, then the first one's staying still. <laughs> right, now that was really, I mean, these are all kind of odd examples I'm playing here, but the point is, is that your mind goes to where it resolves and you don't have to stretch the limits that far, right? If you're working within the context of normal chord progressions. All I was doing in the, in the left hand was playing like the chord tones or the root or whatever, right? It's not, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to get all sticky with all these rules. Learn to play chords on the piano that resolve correctly, and you'll you'll have like three quarters of the battle done with counterpoint. So let's see. When we copy by hand the music, uh, like you did for the Bach Invention Eleven, do we have to hear the music in our head as we copy it? Is it necessary, uh, even if we didn't listen to it before? Um, no. So. This is actually something I was thinking about earlier today as well. It's it's what is it you're thinking about when you're practicing stuff? 
Um, and I think this is actually an important point for people um, because you can mindlessly practice. Everybody, I'm sure we've all been beat to death with this 10,000 hour rule, and I'm just as guilty of it as anybody else. Um, but one of the things that gets left out about the 10,000 hour rule is that it's actually, it's got to be like 10,000 miserable hours, right? It's got to be like really hard work for your brain. I, not necessarily miserable. Maybe that's not a good word. It's got to be taxing, right? So that's why it takes like 13 years. It's not just 10, you can't just for 10,000 hours straight practice and then you'll get it. You can only do like two hours a day. Um, and so it's better to be engaged in your practice for say, 10 minutes than to do an hour of disengaged. Like I can go like this all day long on G flat major. And I, I may come back and I'll have the scale, but I won't understand G flat major the way I really want to understand it, which is why I spent time even just creating that worksheet and thinking through G flat major as a technical problem. Um, so for something like writing out music by hand, you don't have to hear the music in your head as you copy it. Uh, that's the goal. Like, that's what you're trying to earn. And so it's going to be very, very difficult for you to do that. Um, and it's going to be mentally very tiring and taxing at the beginning. On top of it's going to be tiring for your hand, right? Because you're getting used to writing a lot of music in a row. Um, and what I would recommend is sing it because um, at least from what I've seen, the it's like fMRI studies on audiation, which is the ability to hear music in your head and comprehend it, so to know what it means, right? Um, that there's a strong connection to muscles in the throat. And when you think of a higher pitch, even without singing it, that the muscles in your throat will tighten up as if you're singing it. And there's a hot topic, of, and I've talked about it before, it's called embodied knowledge. Um, and it's basically just muscle memory. It's, it's that you, your, your brain doesn't necessarily store all of the necessary information about how to put that into action in your brain. It stores it in other places in your body. Um, and now I don't know if that's a scientific way of saying that. That's effectively the practical way of thinking about it, is that that knowledge is actually encompassed within your throat or within your hand or whatever. And um, one thing I noticed as a kid, I would always pick up a, you know, I played so much music on the trumpet, I would always pick up a, a trumpet part or whatever, and I'd just like, you know, da -da 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 and I'd just start singing through it. And the, um, that I would uh, actually, I would feel my fingers moving along the trumpet fingerings. You know, I could, I would, finger it. I wouldn't just sing it. Right? Whatever it is. And um, I think with uh, audiation, your throat is very important. So the more you sing your music and other people's music, the better. Um, and I, I'm, you know, everybody sings along with their favorite rock tunes and whatever, but I would highly recommend, especially if you're alone and you don't want to annoy the family, sing along with whatever music, Mahler, Mozart, you know, Pink Floyd. It doesn't matter. So, okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. How can we learn to hear in our head? We're copying. Okay, that's basically what I'm talking about. Sing it, sing it, play it on the piano, listen to it, read the score without singing, try to, try to imagine it. You know, it's ear training, transcribing, writing out by hand and singing it, playing, uh, trying to play and sing a voice. Ah, right? Trying to imagine. I was going for the sharp, sharp there. Ah, 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 ah. These are all really the same skill. Um, so, so yeah. Any tips for keeping organ voices in? Three and four counterpoint separate, or is it inevitable that it'll blend into muddiness? I'm I'm not an organ expert, so I can't tell you about like the stops and things. Like, I would say obviously the less uh, overtones and little stops and things you're pulling out to to fatten the sound, the better chance it's going to not be muddy. Um, anytime you spread out the octave that it's in, 
I mean, that sounds like a very thin chord versus... Right? So... I like these kind of open, resonant chords. Um, yeah, that's all I can really say about the organ. Is it possible to send you some of my music in MP3 format? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just email it to me, john.brantingham at artofcomposing.com. Um, john.brantingham at artofcomposing.com. And I will check it out. Okay. Let's see. I love your courses. Many thanks for the amazing lessons. Is there a way to learn and analyze the Impressionism era Debussy and Ravel. Yeah, so you can do it. It's not um, impossible. It some. It's one of those things that it could be difficult sometimes to label a chord in you know a traditional like this is a four chord and it's got you know all those notes in it. You you don't even know where to begin with it. <coughs> so I would say you know Debussy and Ravel operate. Like on a big level, you can figure things out relatively easy. Like here's a phrase, here's a phrase, here's a phrase, right? I would start big to small as much as you can. So this is a section, right? It's a clear change. Um, this is a big section over here. This is a phrase. This is a phrase. In fact, why don't we pull up uh, something like Claire de Lune? Uh, let's see. Claire de Lune. MSLP. So, and then we can take a look at it and just try to, I'll just show you what basic analysis is. And also just, just expect that um, somebody's going to disagree with your analysis and that's just a, a part of the thing. No, I'm logged out of IMSLP, so it wants me to wait 15 seconds. Let me. Okay, I'm logged back in. Let me let me go ahead and add this window here real quick. Uh, why is it not doing? It? There we go. Window capture. And oh no, I need to open it up. I apologize for this. I'm trying to move as quickly as I can. Okay, there we go. Mm. Preview, where are you? No, it's Adobe Acrobat. That's what it is. There we go. Okay. So let's let's zoom out a little bit. Um, if you know the piece, right? Okay, so it's obviously it's beautiful music, um, and it feels so difficult to pin down what's what's going on here. Um, and we can, I'll just point out like there's clearly like a chunk here, right? It starts over again right there. So we can just, uh, you know, I don't know if I can draw on this. I think I can, but I don't know where. Um Right there. Let's see if, you, yeah, you can see that. Okay. Um, no. So we've got that uh, deviate or that like delineation right there. It goes down to this. And then the melody comes back. Um, now, from there, we can just start to like actually list out the notes. F. A flat, right? F, A flat, but D flat right there. And it's in D flat as a key. So I think it's a, it's a good bet to think of that as a D flat chord right there. Um, now you can analyze this in the inversion, right? You can say F is in the bass. 
And just because it's it, F is in the left hand, it's the bass note, right? So it's a 1-6 chord. Right? So we've got G flat, A, C, E flat, and that is a seven chord, right? Fully, fully diminished. And you've got passing, or sorry, neighbor tones. Um, now we got the B flat in here, right? So that's, that feels like a B flat minor chord. Um, so we went from, from a one chord to a seven chord. Now to a B flat minor, which is six. And then now we've got So that's an A flat major chord, right? So we've moved to five. And I, I won't continue on with the whole thing, um, or at least not harmonically. You can see that you can easily pull uh, you know, all the necessary information um, relatively quickly, and, and it's very tonal. It's just very straightforward. It's just counting up. It's counting those notes up and saying, okay, what has F, A flat, and D flat in it? It's a D flat major chord. Um, and then once you get the harmonic stuff figured out, because what's important about the harmonic stuff um, is that cadences are some of your biggest um, flags for the form. They tell you where th where phrases end and begin um, in a lot of in a lot of times. So look for cadences. Um, look for uh, let me get this window out of here. Let's see. Um, you know, look for for that kind of stuff. And then with the melody, you know, you can analyze the melody however you want. You can say like, oh, chord tones. You know that you can you can um, look at what's a passing tone and neighbor tones. You can look for embellishments. You can see if you know he's doing anything to the harmony and changing it in the melody. So. So that's a that's a good way to get started with analysis. Let's see. Hi, this is Frodo7241. Um, I'm new here. I have my first ever music lesson coming up this next semester. How do I prepare? Um, well, that's kind of a broad question. I would assume that if it's your first music lesson ever, that they're expecting that you don't know anything about music. So I think you're... Your, you know, unless you want to get ahead and start learning how to read music, um, some of the basics you don't really need a teacher for. Like you don't need a teacher to to show you that a quarter note is four beats. There's like YouTube videos all over the place that can show you that stuff. So if you haven't learned how to read music and you've got the time before then, I would learn how to read music. I would probably more than anything else spend a lot of time listening to a lot of music just really all over the place you know um the kinds of music that you like the kinds of music that you don't like the kinds of mu that music that everybody says you should be listening to if you want to be a composer uh you know the kinds of music that everybody says you shouldn't listen to i don't know just just listen to a ton of different music um and those are probably only two things that i would worry about preparing if it's your first music lesson ever uh, and probably out of those two, listening is it, just get a get a good habit of listening regularly to a lot of music. Um, and you know, obviously, if you can't read, don't don't worry about score reading or anything like that right now. Okay, just the last question: When you copy the Invention Eleven, did you copy it measure by measure, or did you first start by copying one phrase of the melody? Um, I did all of that. I would do sometimes, you know, a measure. Uh, sometimes, I, if it depends on what you want to get out of it, right? If you want to see how I really love this melody, you know, then I'm going to copy that as a melody, not as a, right? I'm not going to go. 
I mean, I may stop and look at those, but my primary concern is how did he write that melody to feel or sound like that that was? And actually, I think um, Bach didn't write that. I think that's one of those ones that he threw in the book for his wife, and it's not actually his own, but it got attributed to him, if anybody's curious. So... Okay, um, let me check my email because I think there is probably a score here. And we will open this up in Sibelius. Give me one moment. Make sure my G flat major is saved here. And let's go ahead and open up this one. Okay. Okay. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, let's listen. Okay, well, uh, thank you for sending that over. Um, I would say that you you may want to you may want to work on some different kinds of um, of counterpoint exercises first before jumping into fugue, uh, because I see some some basic uh, problems. Um, like for instance, here this. This is parallel octaves, and it even though you've got this note in between here, it, it just really stood out. It sounds like what you do is you add a second voice for a second, and then it goes back to one voice, right? That's a, that's a very basic counterpoint problem, um, and when you're trying to get your head wrapped around those... Um, those rules, right? And within strict counterpoint, they're rules. That's that's what you have to... These are the, the times when you say that we do follow rules, right? When you're doing counterpoint exercises like this. Um, that, you know, you should work on your voice against voice first. Just very basic, right? These are all... These are all... Um, you know, not difficult to to get your head wrapped around, um, and there, you know, there's books about them. There's like fifty thousand books on counterpoint and species exercises going back, you know, hundreds of years. So take your pick. I like the exercises by Peter Schubert in his book um, Modal Counterpoint Renaissance Style. Um, I think that he's he's really figured out the best way to teach it, which is step by step and looking at each individual. Uh, note movement, uh, you know, like, and trying to figure out how many possible options do I have to to harmonize that, you know, or uh, 
and you go through systematically and you learn how to control just one note against one note and then you know two notes like um those kinds of little movements um and then once you master those you move on to the next voice and the next voice and then you come to back to something like this and you don't have to worry so much if this single vo voice moving here is legal or not um, because what those rules do they, they do a couple things there's harmonic rules that tell you which note should follow which note and one of the things is um, you know with the bass now you've got it in G minor here um, and it, it feels like it was supposed to be something kind of tonal. Um, but it's it ended up being kind of like this Dorian sounding. Or maybe that's, uh, you know, Aeolian. Okay. I got to learn those ones better. But um, you, you never give us any information about like... <laughs> right, the the leading tone, which is critical to hearing something in G minor as like tonally. Uh, now, if you're going for that modal sound, I, I understand that as well. Uh, let me jump back see if you've uh, mentioned it. No, I don't think you've commented. Um, let's see what else can I say here. Where did it go? I lost my Sibelius window. There we go. Um. Now, in terms of your subject is is extremely long. And it, it it's not clear where things are going harmonically. And that's, I think, what makes it difficult to to grab onto as a piece is that um, it, it meanders for a really long time in the bass. And then the the melody comes in or sorry the uh, soprano that's nice oh but there y you missed an easy resolution right here right let me make sure everybody can still see this i think it's out of there we go um you missed this really simple resolution so if we play it again Uh, now, once again, you're still going to have this problem with the parallel octaves um, if you go up to this B-flat and that B-flat there, but uh, depending on what chord you mean here, right? Looks like you kind of want to have a B-flat um, a B-flat major 7th going on. Um, let's see. We could do that now. We can, right? And even though they're octaves, you still hear it as two voices. <laughs> I'm just curious, like, where does this want to go? You could take that. Oh, this just is crying out, crying out to go to that B flat right there, um, which would make this E a little bit, a little bit strange. Hold on, let's see. It, it does kind of have a cool sound, but it's. Uh, see, maybe you do something like this. Oh, well, first, um, I would. Maybe we'll do. Okay, let's listen to this whole little bit here. Right now, I would probably I didn't like this going back up. Okay. Oh, 
here's a good spot for parallel parallel tense here, right? Oh, sorry, the parallel sixes. And you can see I could I could make this not not dotted, right? You can see it a little bit easier. around with stuff so hopefully hopefully that helps I mean you can see that um, that your 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 heart's in the right place I, I feel like you're doing good things with your rhythm right it, it looks like counterpoint like it looks like a piece that you would get in a counterpoint exercise book where the rhythmic placement of things and you've got uh, you know syncopation sometimes your your way of notating is a little bit um, little bit awkward, but that that can be fixed with a book like Behind Bars by Elaine Gould, um, you know, and having a good reference for notation. Um, but it's more your the way your voices resolve and understanding the implied harmony of your piece. I think if you take, um, <coughs> sorry, need a drink of water. If you take whatever you really like about this piece, right? Uh, an aspect of the melody um, and, uh, or, you know, an aspect of the harmony, or, you know, you can you can look at what I did here and try to recreate it. Um, I think, I used to send this stuff to people, um, but I think it, it'll be good for you to, to look back and, um, and try to copy what I do and messing around with your own file or try to come up with something new at a basic level, and this kind of ties in with the other counterpoint stuff we were talking about, uh, there's just a couple uh, intervals that always are going to sound good. And it's considered a, you know, a no-no to have more than, say, three um, thirds in a row. Right? Uh, then they want you to... They want you to then start to split it up again and move in contrary motion. However... As a composer that just has to get things done sometimes, just just go for those tenths, right? It'll sound like a great counter melody. <laughs> and then you change up the rhythm just a little bit. Right? No, that was kind of a terrible example. But, but you change it up just a little bit, and um, you can create a very convincing counter melody from very basic stuff. So thirds, sixes... Right? And then if you want it to feel like separate lines. Have them move in contrary motion to each other. And just, if you can't reach that third without it sounding awkward like it did right there, you know, I don't remember what I just did. <laughs> You're probably messing something up for one thing, but connect it. Right? Just throw in blah, blah, a little run. These are all the little methods that I use to cheat at my counterpoint. And and the average person can't tell the difference anyway. <laughs> so, so just cheat. Um, okay. So we're coming up on an hour here. Uh, I think this has been kind of a fun one. Um, if anybody has any last questions, I'll, I'll go ahead and take them here. Let's see. Do you plan on any new courses, by the way? Your website was recommended by Berkeley Online, or I'm currently studying orchestration. Oh, that's good that they recommend my website. Um, so I talked about this a little bit last week. I've gone back and forth about creating new courses, and, and instead what I'm doing is I'm actually editing the original courses because what I've realized is, is um, often there's too much information for people. They're trying to learn too many new things and not getting back to mastering the basics. Um and when I say uh, master, I I truly mean master in the most traditional sense. So, you know, <laughs> I like this. I'm uh, I'm I want you know the people going through my courses and the people coming to my website 
to do the things that most people are not going to do that actually make a huge difference in how natural you are with the music, right? Spending time going through and playing things like 151 in different inversions in different keys. Oh. Right? And you're not going to get it perfect every time. But those are the two critical the two critical sonorities of of uh, the major scale and there's my G flat there. Um, and I think that you owe it to yourself to be able to play at least one five one in every key in different positions in the right hand. Um, and then eventually add on to that more and more progressions and memorize these things. You know, there's a lot of talk of the, of partimenti, you know, Right, that's a that's a real famous where the the bass kind of moves around in a little circle like that. Those things are like those are like the shared little chunks of music that all composers really have the right to use. I mean, going back for hundreds of years, uh, you know. If you come up with that chord progression and you think you're a genius, just realize like it's been used about a gajillion times and it's still okay to use. The reason we can still use it is because it still sounds great. I don't care how many times it's been done. There's always a way to change it. Right? Those are all really, really well-known types of chordal movements. And I guarantee the next time you hear that on a song, it's going to feel really good and fresh and new because they'll change one little thing. It'll be the, the instruments they're using, or they'll change the melody, or they'll add an inflection, or whatever, and it refreshes it. You know, um, So, so kind of a roundabout way of saying, you know, I want everybody to, to stick to and really get those basics under under control, get them in your fingers, practice composing by hand every day. I, you know, I'm a traditionalist and I think there's a lot of benefit. I'm not bagging on anybody who just uses the computer or just, you know, does a certain style, has no keyboard skills, doesn't play any instruments. You know, we're all coming from different places and different, um, you know, we all grew up listening to different music and different influences. Um, but that doesn't mean that any of this is off the table. You know, I, Part of my realization and just with my heavier studying of piano is that um, my image of myself as a musician has always been a trumpet player. And um, I I just realized that I'm not the trumpet, right? I, I don't have to stick to the trumpet and say, this is my main thing. And if I don't touch the trumpet for six months or, you know, a year or two years, I'm okay with that. As long as I'm doing the thing that I really love, and right now, um, you know, I'm calling myself a pianist composer. Like I, I want to take on that that identity, and I also want to take on that responsibility of saying that I'm going to learn this instrument as best as I can. And whatever your instrument that you're choosing to learn right now, whether it's piano or your hand, you know, writing or your brain, and you're just thinking about music and you're considering that it's like this is my instrument up here. Um, you know, just just go for it. So stick to the basics. See, uh, when is your next symposium? Symposium. I need to get a better name for this, don't I? Please, if you got a good idea for a, for a name here, send me a name because I I don't know. Sometimes I pick stupid names like symposium. I saw it somewhere, and you know, symposium sounds so official. If you got a good, I mean, maybe we just call it composer Q and A or something. Um, all that being said, I think it's probably right now it's going to be Mondays. I feel like Monday's a really good day for me to do this. My schedule's pretty clear. Um, so it's probably going to be Monday uh, if, you know, I think probably after lunch on Mondays, uh, 1 or 2 o'clock. I'm not sure yet. I'm going to look at next week and, and see when is a good time to do this. I'll, I'll, I'll try to set it up on, on a regular basis, though. Um, any good book recommendations for composing for chamber music or any small arrangements? Um, I 
you know, I don't know specifically about a chamber music book. I I would start by just reading scores um, and looking at, uh, you know, look at what is your what is your goal musically, and is it is it achievable with that chamber group or whatever, you know? So um, if you've got these ideas and sounds in your head, uh, give yourself the limitation of that chamber group and try to get as close to that as possible. Um, you know, I've been listening. If you want to listen to jazz chamber type stuff, um, I think Gil Evans' arrangements are as close to classical as jazz is ever going to be. Um, actually, I don't. I I think the boundaries are kind of blurred. It's all kind of the same stuff. So, uh, but Gil Evans' arrangements for Miles Davis, as I was talking about at the beginning, uh, I've just really been digging into those recently, and they're just amazing. Um, you know, I like Mendelssohn's Octet for kind of a larger string group. Um, the Schubert octet, which is like mixed instruments is really good. Um, there's, I mean, there's so is string quartets. Ravel's string quartet is my favorite, I think. Um, and the late Beethoven string quartets are amazing. All the Beethoven string quartets are amazing. Uh, Mozart, I, I like his string quintets as well. Don't just, don't just do the quartets. Quintets sound great. Um, I don't know why there aren't more quintets. I love having that extra bass in there. But um, uh, let me see what else chamber, and then you know, there's so many piano and and solo instruments and piano trios that it just is hard to know where to even begin. I you know just take your pick. Um, so yeah, I see Frodo's got one more question. We can send you music we write. Yeah, you can um, you can just email it to me. I'm I'm not gonna be able to take a look right now, but next symposium, if you wanna go ahead and email it at that time. Um, could you make a course or a post about harmony or French of French symbolism and impressionism? So, um, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by French symbolism, if that's a specific, um, genre or style of French composing, but, um, the impressionist stuff, I, I could definitely, you know, talk about it's, it's in a sense, a lot of it is, is jazz harmony, Right, it's it's big kind of. If you can understand jazz harmony, you'll you'll probably have a better grasp of impressionist music. But yeah, I'll try to do that. Um, okay, thanks everybody. I will see you again probably next week. And uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, like I said, I got some big stuff with the academy coming really soon. I'm trying to figure out how the transition works, but I've got uh, the new academy software, and it's really amazing. Um, and there's going to be a price drop, so if you're thinking about buying, uh, you may want to hold off a day or two. Uh, and if you bought within like the last few days, um, you know I I can give you the the new price. Don't worry. So, okay, um, I will talk to everybody later. Bye.